Jidak, ya. Pak Krisna, salam kenal. Krisna yang kedua. Wah, salam. Salam dari, salam dari Pajak Angin. We have quite... Uh... Gak ada, gak ada celebrity celebrity ngejual terlalu banyak si Krisna satunya tuh. <laughs> ya. Krisna satunya. <laughs> We have quite a, a celebrity speaker roll up. We've got, you know, Priya now. We've got Tia Miss Indonesia 2017. Made Astawa who was on CNN Indonesia. Awesome. Hi Sally. Oh, Sally's gone. Hi Sally Lewis. Welcome to the. Hi, thanks. <laughs> welcome, welcome. And. Uh, Welcome to the webinar, Sally Lewis. And we have here two Dita, <laughs> two tree trees. Awesome, four tree trees. Nice. Green tech guy. Who's the green tech guy? Are you Sudana? Welcome. Thank you. I don't know you. Yeah, turn on your video. Yeah, let's let's I'm try. <laughs> I'm trying to work it out now. <laughs> If we want to change Bali, we gotta have the conversation on unmute video on. Okay, hold on. That's very weird. Welcome to all the new guests. Wow. There's a lot of tricks for you. I think, Dita, you shared the, your link to, to a lot of friends like I did. So if you're joining as a guest, please rename with your name and what you represent. So you could say your company, your website. You could just say guest if you want to. That will be easier for us to start a conversation. Jadi yang baru ikut sebagai guest bisa ganti namanya di Zoom biar kita tahu dari mana datangnya, nama dan perusahaannya. Kalau ada perusahaan. If you don't have a company, don't worry, you can just say Green Enthusiast or Eco Warrior or Green Hero, something fancy. You're on mute. Who's got the rooster? <laughs> Piet Van Zyl, welcome Hi. to the webinar. Yeah. Hi, sorry, I'm Hiti. I'm I'm usually in Bali. Due to COVID, I'm in New Zealand for a few months. So um yeah, but my heart's in Bali and everything that's going on there. I'm really, really interested in ways that um uh I work in the education sector or um you know i'm interested in education and um interested in ways i'm keeping my ears to the ground about what's going on um so in the future we can make some good plans of how to um, act on things later Amazing. on in bali would it be possible to change your name because <laughs> right now you're still called trifi tri muhammadita how, 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 that's not that's not me how, how am i how, how do i change it so just go to your top right of your of your image and you'll see three dots in blue and you'll have the option to rename. Um, hang on a minute. Speak of yeah. Hi, Selena. Hi. Oh, hello. So Selena is a member of JCI Badung Bali, which is a social activist group. Yeah. Below 40 years old to give back to the community, to network and have business development. So thank you for joining. <laughs> Selena, you can put JCI after your name. Why not? Yes, yes, do that. Hi, everybody. I'm Ivit uh, Fonsale. I'm from Positive Impact Forever, and um, I specialize in zero waste programs here in Bali. Nice. Um, Piet, would you be possible to add in your name Zero Impact? Or what was the Positive name? Yeah, Impact on, Forever. Like, 
Yes, that's right. Okay, I can do that. And thank you for what you're doing. Zero impact is amazing. Hattie Bradley, yes, I thought so. I, I was like, <laughs> you were in the last webinar. I was like, I know this person. It's not uh, Trihatra Mita, yeah. Mark Winans, welcome to the webinar. If you represent a company or you own a company or you represent a movement, you can add in into your name. So Mark Winans dash the company. Yeah, hi. Uh, no, a private person. Just curious. Just curious. You can write yes. that. Mark Winans dash just curious. curious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We've got one of our most amazing human beings in Bali, which is Rob from the Practice Yoga. Such a, such a great, amazing person. As a, as a member of Be Greener, he's really active, really active in the group. Rob, you want to <laughs> say hi and maybe give an update on, you know, how you're doing? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, it's, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be part of this group. Um, I did an incredible... Um, uh, what do you call it? Podcast uh, yesterday, and um, it was around conscious living and how you can choose to live conscious and early um, use conscious um, intention when you're building a, a project, which is what we're doing. And it was really fascinating to hear me talk about what I was doing because I didn't realize it was so amazing. And the lady that was following me and asking me these questions, I'm like, oh, wow, okay, yeah, we are doing a lot. So, you know, I really love that. So for me, you know, as the owner, uh, the co-founder of the practice of yoga studio in Changu was really taking, you know, that wisdom and applying it to daily life, community life, and what can I do to be of service to others? and uh, awesome job Krishna love love knowing you and I love your energy that's a sign of a good person when they don't realize how much good they're doing that somebody <laughs> else has to tell them thank you for what you're doing <laughs> there you go thank you Ralph for joining and then we also have David he's the guy with the suit David change your name to David also from JCI Badung Bali it's an amazing community right good Hello. Hi, David. Change your name because you're not called Dita. Hi, Krishna. How are you? Good, 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 good. Yeah, so thank you again. Uh, it's really good to have, you know, to be a part of the community. And I, uh, you're well, yeah, I mean, I'm from the Junior Chamber International Bad in Bali. And yeah, it's really nice. And I can't wait to hear about what is going on. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining. And don't forget to rename your name. So these are the key of the webinar. The key of the webinar is every month we get together and we discuss about collaboration, opportunities for networking. We learn about amazing speakers who can motivate us, help us take action. And today, the speaking roster could not be more and more amazing. It is such, such such a pleasure for me to introduce these three speakers. So the first speaker will be Made Astawa. His, uh, his name is Astawa speaker. So Made Astawa is a village leader in Peking Kajing. And he has helped with the help of David Metcalf and a few key foreigners for the Togetherness Project, which has been such an amazing project to get people employed, to get people to work on something that is greater than themselves. The second speaker is Priyatna. Priyatna is a green architect. Also, as you can see in, the, in his image, there's Krishna Wawarunto beside him. <laughs> it's just, it's just a, a random coincidence. So Krishna Wawarunto is part of the Bumi Langit one of the most amazing permaculture design <laughs> courses in Indonesia. And Priyatna would do this course with Bumi Langit. And our final speaker, and oh my God, are we lucky? Are we so lucky? We have Asintia Nielsen, also called Tia Nielsen. She is not only the brand ambassador for Give Them a Future Project to help the people who need, but she is also Miss Indonesia 2017. Guys, give it up 
amazing line of speakers today. Thank you for the time. Thank you for the energy. And thank you for what you will do today, which will be sharing your wisdom, sharing your insight. And then in return, us as a community, we will discuss how can we change Bali for the better. Before I jump in to the webinar, I'd like to have a little bit of a word from Alex from the Bali Pledge. He has some exciting news for us. So I'm gonna hand it over to Alex. By the way, Alex is the brainchild of the Be Greener community and the brainchild of this monthly webinar. So please, without further ado, give a hand to Alex. Hi, Krishna. Very, very happy to have these monthly gatherings with you all. And I absolutely love uh, what you bring. So I commend you for the incredible work you are doing for the community uh, and for Bali. So I'm very excited to share with you where we are with the Bali Pledge and a little bit about the new website. So the intention with the Bali Pledge is to see the current situation in a positive light, thinking, okay, now there are no more tourists, everything has come to a standstill. How can that be a good thing? And instead of just complaining about it and see the negative of the situation, how can we keep a positive outlook and see what are the opportunities there? And together with a large number of organizations, we believe this is a unique opportunity to change the narrative and attract the kind of tourists we want to see in Bali. You know, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world, or let's embody and project the kind of tourists and we want for Bali. In a nutshell, it's pretty clear with what's going on around the world that mass tourism as we know it has disappeared and is unlikely to come back. So what do we want to replace it with? Well, our intention is to not just wait, but kind of drive the change and drive in which direction we want tourism to go. And it's around the idea of intentional travel. Wherever your attention goes, your energy follows. So what kind of intention should we have when we come to Bali? Can we just inspire the kind of energy that people would have when they come to Bali? So that's the spirit and the intention with the Bali Pledge. So I'm very honored to share with you now, I'm gonna share my screen share with you now what the Pali Pledge looks like. So this is the Balinese version and we have an English version as well. So you can see the Engli English here and English here and Balinese here. So here is how it works. You've got our social media at the top and I really invite you to check us out, help us grow the community, share it and share the posts of the Bali Pledge. And how do we reinvent just by being a community, just by growing and expressing our intention for Bali? So here is the Bali Pledge, and I'm going to read it to you. People of Bali, I take this pledge to preserve and protect your beautiful and unique island home. I vow to tread lightly, I kindly, and explore mindfully. I shall not take what is not given. I shall not harm what does not harm me. I shall respect the spirituality that transcends all aspects of Balinese life. So really, the pledge comes from the traditional Balinese philosophy of Trihita Karana, and also inspired by the Palau Pledge, with the intention that if we support the community we want to have, if we stay close to nature, if we honor the spirit of Bali, then I will be well. So the intention is, to get people to Bali who want to be well. And you're gonna be well if you take care of everyone else. I cannot be well if everyone else around me is not well. That's the intention and the vision for uh, the Bali Pledge. It's to be signed by Balinese, by businesses, by foreigners, by tourists tomorrow who come to Bali. And our ultimate dream is for the Bali Pledge to be some kind of a stamp that goes into the passports for anyone entering Bali to be asked to sign it and then we will know that they have a clear intention coming to Bali. So the website will be, uh, the new website will be live in just a few days. Just wanted you to see it first, so you see it before everyone else. And yeah, with that in mind, I just wish you all a fantastic uh, webinar. And I'm very excited uh, for Krishna and all the speakers to come. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you, Alex. 
as you can see, the Bali Pledge is a grassroots movement. It's not one leader at the top telling us what to do. It's us as individuals getting together to do something good. Now, the Tikita Karana in Action webinar is a two-hour webinar. The first hour is about getting to know the speakers, where we get to know them as, as people, as their ambassador for what they're doing. The second hour will be the open Q&A, where us as the audience can ask any question that we want to the speakers so that we can focus on how we can get inspiration, motivation, collaboration. So please, in the chat box, if any time you want to write something, hey, message me because I have a project that we can work together on, please go ahead and explode the chat box. What we want at the end of this webinar is for us to have all these networking connections for us to get together and do something good. Now, let us begin with our very first speaker. Who should I pick first? Let's go with Made, Pak Made Astawa, the speaker from the Peyangkangin village, who has now been on the news with CNN Indonesia. He's been in contact with the Ministry of Tourism. They were able to raise donations and raise up the village. In essence, they have created employment opportunities for the Peyangkangin village. So not only have they been able to feed the people with immediate help with how do you call it, emergency food, but they've been able to reintroduce an industry that was lost in the village. So, Pamadi Astawa, hello, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Krishna. Good, yes, very good to have you, thank you. Thank so you tell us, much. how, you know, who are you? Um, you, you said that you are from, you're from Bali, obviously, you're wearing the Kuningan, Galungan, but you add that traditional clothing. So, Tell us a bit about your story, you know, a bit about your background. Okay, thank you, Krishna. So I'm so honored to be in this group today. There are so many amazing people in this group today. So I'm just a newcomer, I think I can say, yeah. Okay, my name is Made Astawa. I'm right now, starting January 2020, I was supposed to be a Klian Banjar, not, not a leader affiliate yet. So, so in Pejengkangin, we have eight Banjar. So Pesalakan is one of them. So I'm Kliandinas of Banjar Pesalakan. But before, since 2018, I was uh, the leaders of the recent village of Pejengkangin. Ketua uh, Darwis, if they said in, in Bahasa. So uh, we've been trying to, to promote our village since 2018. It's more about nature and culture that we have. But since the pandemic, we cannot have uh, tourists anymore. That's why we try to go to a virtual tour. This is the one that uh, the, the, the government tried to, to push us to do as well. And in my banja right now, which we, like Krishna said earlier, we get help from, we be one of the togetherness project uh, managed by David Metcalf, Colin, uh, Stephanie Brook, Susan, there's so many uh, expats there that already help us until today. And that what we do in our Banjar is uh, the plastic exchange that's initiated by Mr. Janur Yasa. This was incredible change. We've been doing three times until this month already. And then so we do also Ikat Revival that's been asleep for 25 years. It's because of COVID, so many people need a job. And then uh, David Metcalf come to my village, like what your people doing before tourism coming. So our answer is a weeping, because or tenun in Bahasa. So we try to call the woman that have been done it. We cut, we, ha we have meeting on May 2020 and about 10 women sign up and then we start with them. And then only one month, we already get, we have a product and able to send it to Canada, Thailand, because of the togetherness project support us behind. And rather than that, after that we get media come to our fields and try to split it out through all the media that have been in Bali. But, and then 
the, the governments of Gyanyar call me and have meeting in, in the office in Gyanyar and they try to support us as well in some of uh, exhibition that uh, held by the, the governments in, in, in Gyanyar. So Bamade, I'm gonna ask you about, we, we had a call earlier today and I, w I found it really interesting because the reason that all of this came together, you mentioned was about frustration. You were frustrated about something. What was that frustration? <gasps> all Tell right. us. For a, for a new leader, for a new Klian Dinas, this, the cop, just two months, I was a tour driver before. So January, they put me to be a Klian Dinas. And in March, this was the COVID coming during the Nyepi or silent day. So on May, the start help coming from the governments, from the, the third party. So we from the eighth Banja, the next of my banja, it was uh, north of my banja called Pengembungan, south is Temadik. Both get help from the third party. Every single um, leaders of family get help. For me, there is no resource in my banja. There is no fila. So all your no... neighbors, they receive some kind of help from the government or third parties, but your banja, which you were a leader of, did not get any help and you were we, frustrated. We, we only get help from the government, but only certain people that are allowed to receive the, the help. Only certain people. Yeah, and then David McCall come, uh, come to me like, what I can help you. I tell him, if we help one, we should help everyone. Mm -hmm. So you didn't need to, we need the first time we made 170 foot parcel or sembako we call in Bali. So we able to, to, to transfer that to my, my members of, of community around May is 170 uh, food parcel. And then wow. after one, the next few days, the, the donations keep coming to the togetherness project and then that kids call me again and we have a meeting. We need to do something serious about this donation. We will not, just keep a, a food parcel that will make, I'm sorry, your, your community will be waiting. Mm. Just waiting because they will know every month the leaders will bring Pusambaku. Every month will bring Pusambaku. Everyone will be waiting. Right. So we should create a job. So we should create opportunity from these uh, donations coming. And then we contact SOS in Saminyat. We have a meeting. From the donation that we have, we try to op to make a to create a job for the woman in the in the village because. And Made, Made, I, what I love, love like about this story is that you yourself as a leader did not wait for somebody else to help you. You didn't you, you didn't think, oh, let me just wait for another third party to help me. You said, okay, here's an opportunity. Let me become the help, and then not only you, but as a community you've raised up the bar. And that's what I like about the story, that the project did not wait for somebody else to start. You had David Metcalf who was in the neighborhood and you created something. And that, that's such an amazing thing. Now, you talked about weaving, right? You talked about employment. Let's talk a bit about that amazing event where you had the weaving work in an exhibition that was run by Ibu Koster, so the wife of the governor of Bali. Tell us about the experience of that. How did that happen? Oh, well, that's, that's one of uh, amazing things that happened to our ECAT group as well. The, we just a new ECAT group just revivals in this year because we connect with the Gyanyar uh, woman leader, which is uh, Ibu Bupati Gyanyar. She's the one that gave us a recommendation to join this uh, exhibition. It was in one of restaurants in Ubud called uh, Bali Patastic in Tegalalang. It was uh, last, last month. We had a two days uh, exhibition. It's, a, it's the opening of the restaurant. And then Sir Ibu Koster, uh, as a leader of a woman in Bali, she's the one that uh, held the, the, the exhibition, the joining with BPD Bali. That's uh, it's so, so exciting. It's, like it's, like, it's so exciting because from all these networking events, such so many beautiful things are happening. And 
I like to talk about also the virtual tour because that went on CNN Indonesia. It's been over the news because it's quite revolutionary to have a tour that's virtual, especially since it's going to require a lot of effort because in the jungle, there's not a lot of Wi-Fi there. That's so how, how did that happen? You know, where did the idea come from and how is it that it, the idea really caught on? Uh, we, it's the first time it was uh, in the tourism board of Gianyar, actually. It's the group of Oktavis Gianyar. It would like to make a virtual tour in the beginning, but everyone is waiting. This one is waiting for the government to start. It's waiting for uh, this. So for me, I just jumped in with one of my friends. He was uh, a Japanese agency. It's an A2 Bali. And I called him to come to my village and try to to collaboration with him because I don't have the tool because we need a stabilizer for the phone and then so the, the strongest um, signal for the phone as well because we need to come to the little jungles around and to the rice field and coming back again to the village as you can see in my Facebook the the, the route that we take but after it was not easy as well to con con convince the agents in Japan is called a Petra. They're the one that's uh, uh, approving this tour is allowed to sell or not. So we, we need three time rehearsal. The first time we do is too long. They say that people will be watching could be boring. It's only allowed one hour. The second time we try to reduce to one hour, they say it's too rust. <laughs> and then so we do the, the third rehearsal, we try to before we do rehearsal, we try to do one more uh, walk with, with the, the tour guide. Because I am speaking Bahasa in English, and this the guy will explain in Japanese to the audience in Japan. Wow. So this was <laughs> quite extra effort again. About Pamade, Pamade, you understate your ability to collaborate and your ability to take rejection. I think we can all learn from you. You hear that? He got rejected three times with his proposal, with his project, and he went at it again. And also your ability to collaborate. We all have a page to learn from you. Now, there's one last thing we'd like to ask you to introduce yourself. Is right now you are in the Togetherness project. How can the community help you? What's the next step? You know, how can we help in growing what you're doing? I think so at the moment, we try to use the, the momentum of pandemic. It's like plastic exchange, for example, is also, it's rather than helping people, so many donations actually come to Bali right now from every single person. But in, in meantime, they just send it directly to people in need in some of the point in the Banja that they know. But uh, why we do some collaboration right, right now with the plastic exchange, with the togetherness project, because at the moment, wherever you are in Bali, wherever you stay in Bali, so just try to contact with the leaders of Banjar in your place or the leaders of the village in your place to do the plastic exchange. Because this momentum, people need rice. But as a leader, we also need our environment clean. So one action will kick three times. The first time, we help the people in need. The second time, we, we clean the environment. The third one, we try to educate people, not try what we educate people from now. Like what I do in my banyar, after the third action, they try to, they, they start to understand how to split the trust from the house. Where they put the plastic, where they put the bottle, where they put the waste, other waste. And next month, we will have the, from the community of Gyanyar, they call it Echo Ensin. It's one, one more thing will come up in my banyar. So we will try to, to, to manage the, the waste from the kitchen, which has become an uh, echo and sing. This is going to be amazing. amazing. So there you go. For the audience in here listening, Amari Astawa suggests that if you want to do something, go to the Kilian Banjar, Kilian Dinas, the village elders. They're the ones who can tell you how they can help, how you can help. And that will be a clear guide. Thank you very much, Mandi Astawa, for your introduction. Now, to the second speaker, who will it be? Let's have Priyana. 
Priyatna is an amazing individual. Showing by example, Priyatna is a green architect focusing on urban farming. But with COVID, he also has been very proactive. He's now started a very, very successful plant, plant delivery business where he'll send you seeds that you can plant at your own home. One of the most amazing things that I found about Priyatna is that he is self-sufficient. He has a house totaling 150 meters squared, 1.5 ara, and he has been able to sustain himself for all his protein and vegetable needs with just that piece of land. So everybody, say hello to Priyatna. Priyatna, thank you for taking the time to be in this webinar. Thank you. Hi, all. And I remember you have a slide available. So if you want to share your screen, that way we can yes, get to uh, you better. I only have 20 minutes, so I'll just uh, share my... No worry, Sante, Sante. Just, just uh, <laughs> share, share your screen. Don't worry, don't worry. So... Uh, I just want to share what, what can we what can we do in our our house uh, during pandemic or during during any time as a normal human not as an architect as, as a, a human with not with a very limited land so we can plant vegetables we can we can make compost first we can plant vegetables we can farming in a we can have a flock in a very chicken or a fish in a very limited land. Yeah, so, so it's in Bahasa, but basically the three steps yes. of what you can do at your own house. First, you make your own compost. Two, plant vegetables. And three, grow some, um, some, uh, grow some animals. Uh, yeah. Raise some animals. <laughs> yes, grow some animals. Okay, show us, show us what is the black soldier fly. So, okay, this is the composting with the black solid fly. So, it makes the decomposing very fast. Mm, amazing. And this one, you, you don't have this to... Fly. Yeah, amazing. This is the waste. Uh, I put the composting under the papaya fruit and the effect is amazing. The papaya fruit is growing and like... Is this easy. easy to do, the black soldier fly? Sorry? Is it easy to do? Easy, easy, because the 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 insect is everywhere in tropics. So whenever the the the, the fly smell the fermented food, they, they will come. So this one is also you can add it into your compost, right? To make yes, it any any composting system as long as it's aerobic and. Um, so I'm sure in the audience you have, if you have a business that doesn't do that doesn't any sell meat. For example, my family business is a vegan restaurant. Yes. And we've always struggled with this because we don't want to raise some chickens or animals, right? Because mm -hmm. we don't want to kill them. But this is a, a great solution. And I'm sure in the audience, they'll think the same thing. This is a great solution if you don't want to raise animals, but yet have the benefits of having extra products in your compost to make it better. So that's a great idea. I'll, I'll definitely connect with you later on. Yes, continue. And you only need uh, like a small bucket. So mm. you don't need bigger space. So this is the result. Wow. The likes it. <laughs> I, I put it for the fish also. Uh, they will crawl the larva out of the bucket. So it's to feed the fish also. Amazing. Yes. Huh. You don't have to buy fish food. Eight, I enrolled the PDC course with my instructor Krishna, another Krishna, and it's coming accidentally today. <laughs> uh, this is what uh, just a rough sample of what we can plan in our rooftop garden, in our uh, empty land nearby. We can put sayur, vegetables, we can plant. Yes, yeah, so can. just to be clear that most of these images are from his own house, his 150 meter square house. Yes, this so he mentioned that his house and he's also been guerrilla farming, right? You've been using the neighbor's empty land. What's the story yeah. there? 
Yeah, I I I I, I took the the grass for the chicken. The, actually, the, if you know, the chicken eat grass, not only the seeds, but the grass. And after the land clear, so why don't I just put or plant something here? And then I start to plant it because I don't know which the land belongs to the old developer, and then. Uh, it's just a way, so why don't we, we make use of it? And I didn't take anything. I just give them seeds. The yeah. the owner will be. I mean, that's a good point. I know, and everybody, one of us has has a neighbor who has this yeah. empty bare land not yes. being used. I'm sure they have no problem if you're helping to make the land better, right? Yeah. Because you're not using chemicals that will destroy the land. But because you you did the PDC, the permaculture design course, the mindset in, is how to grow plants, yes. grow vegetables without destroying the land. So if you're guerrilla farming in someone's land but not destroying their land, that's a great point to make when you want to use a neighbor's land. Yeah, then they will be happy because the land is clear. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is my rooftop. So I just put everything, most of it as a perennial vegetables. Like uh, basil, Southern uh, yeah. Terence, so everybody can plant it very easy. And it's perennial, so you can plant, you can harvest it anytime you need for salad, for vegetables. That's yeah, so you talked about this, right? You said as a farmer, you mm -hmm. want to grow perennial plants because you can grow them all year round and you can yes. grow them multiple times. And this is important to sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And actually, the condition is uh, it's not just sufficient, it's abundance, and we are thinking uh, we fed the chicken, we give to their neighbors, uh, it's, it's uh, getting too much. <laughs> <laughs> too much! Amazing. Wow, look at that pumpkin in the mint. Yeah, this, this is also really a small pumpkin because it's not ideal, it's then a rooftop because of the zoom, it's like big pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> the main we use it for the tea. We can if you don't if you don't have enough land, we can put it on the wall. I mean any place, no problem. We can put the we can even plant the sorghum, the source of protein, just only in a twenty centimeters diameter and forty centimeters high on the rooftop. So you have to try the limit of the plant. So. Yeah, this is our daily harvest. So it's different when you want to cook and what can you cook with the source? You just find the source and then you decide what to cook. Not deciding, I want to cook that and then find the, but you find the material first and then. That, that's a and great it. mindset. Go to your garden, see what's available and then cook yes. from what's available. This is another perennial vegetables. It's chaya, a source of protein. This is katuk, uh, in Bali is kayu manis, sweet leaf. Mm. This is perennial also, so you can harvest it anytime you want. You don't need to replant the seeds. This is all perennial. This is the daun ginseng in Java. Is, uh, ginger, ginger, yeah. Yeah, um, it's different. It's oh. the, we we use it, the, we use the leaf, not, not ginger, this is the, Talinum, talinum species. The leaf is edible and very easy to plant. Just cut it and plant and replant. After you harvest, you can replant and then it will grow. This is the moringa, very incredible. Hello, moringa, yeah. Yeah, when you cut, they will grow. When you cut, they will grow. When you cut, they will grow. And the nutrient is amazing. Like a, the nutrient is like a hoax. Seven times higher vitamin D than milk. Yeah, and it's if like you don't know, in, in, <laughs> in Africa, so they, yeah, in Africa they call it the drumstick tree. Yes, because it has so much protein, so you can have it in powder form. You can put it in as a vegetable. And it's, you don't need. Realized, mm. You don't need a uh, big land. You just only need like a small trunk, and then they will grow, regrow. Wow. Because we don't have so much land, we just we can even plan on the the near the street in front of our house. This is the Alter and so the Brazilian spinach, very easy to harvest. And I plan also on the nearby street on my neighbor's land. 
because they don't care. So just ask, can I plant it here? Oh yeah, yeah, sir. Yes, of course. Plant it. <laughs> Rather than having a rubbish dump yeah. by the street, you now have a green, green garden that people can can take from. You know, it's amazing what you can do. There's no better way to meet your neighbor than than saying, "Hey, I want to build a garden." That's the best way. Yeah, this is the girl farming. I plan a sorghum on the empty land. <laughs> This is the local pura in behind our uh, neighborhood. So we can plant the raspberry also. It's nice when you collect like um, yeah. like foraging because you cannot plant it in, her, in, in your house. The plant is too big and um, too dense. <laughs> you can plant any plant that you can get use of it. You can take advantage of it. I plant this uh, talas, the alocasia. For my food, uh, for my chicken food. Hmm, chicken food, okay. And this is the water spinach, kangkung. This is the type of leaf you can forage. Uh, some is poisonous, like uh, this one. The uh, on the left is poisonous. The others is edible, like uh, chaya, gedi, cassava, uh, papaya. And we can use it. This is literally garden to kitchen. We get the bucket and harvest it and just cook. And from the hobby, I start to sell it online on Instagram to my friends, to my yeah. And because the actually everyone can can plan and can grow plan because sometimes they don't have enough courage to then. I cannot grow plants, but with very, if we start from very easy plants, you can grow your own food. And that's and a good point, the feedback right? From, yeah, it's the feedback from my customer when nice. they first get the harvest. Uh, it's bring also, it bring back the happiness to me. Oh, they, they, can, they can grow their own food. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Let, let, let's talk about what you're sharing, the short end of your food chain. That's really interesting, right? Because, can we go back? Yeah, so that slide, we're talking about how to help the environment, how to be a better human being, how to reduce a carbon footprint, and there's yeah. nothing better than growing your own food because the food chain is directly your garden, okay. your plate. There is no better solution. That's... Have, have you had any feedback about this? Uh, you know, people telling you, wow, you're not only growing your own food, but you're reducing your carbon footprint. Um, I, I, I like to think differently. I like to think small. Uh, we just take advantage of ourselves, of myself. And then the others is just a side effect. And the side effect can be big or can be bigger or can be even bigger. Uh, we don't care as just we do good for yourself and then the other is uh, side effect yeah that's an that's an amazing thing right you know some people their goal is to reduce a carbon footprint but your goal is how to feed yourself but by being by feeding yourself you are automatically reducing your carbon footprint so i just want to mention that and you know thank you for what you're inspiring us all to do to grow your whole your own home garden thanks this is our chicken garden in front of our house. So <laughs> it's a bit messy, but and a bit noisy, but uh, I like it. Uh, so since uh, two years ago, I never bought uh, single eggs or chicken. We get uh, this from our our garden. So if we if if I have a choice, what do you want to grow a nice garden with? Uh, with uh, grass, or you, you want to grow uh, chicken in a small land, it's a very easy question, it's very easy choice for me. I, I prefer to grow a chicken. <laughs> now, I'm sure the audience, you have some neighbors with chicken, you're like, I wish there was no more chickens. But hey, this is a, this is a great you know, source of protein, and the poop, the, the, the chicken manure, is just great, great compost.
and wow. when, when you grow your your own eggs it is different the taste is different uh, you will taste a very fresh and natural eggs and you will you won't smell so because the chicken digestive system is very simple sometimes you can still smell the smell of the uh, the food but when you your chicken eat natural food and then it's different and you mentioned one thing about the smell right it doesn't smell yeah now, it doesn't smell at all why, we, why is that why is that because in my experience any chicken coop I've been passing by always you smells. put a lot of carbon on it, like uh, dried leaves or so the the composting system is naturally works. Uh, it's hot and the bacteria is there, and even it's uh, like a semi-intensive, like a dense population, but uh, there is no odor at all. Show us the next photo. Yeah, put the very. Uh, layer we put the layering on the base with the uh, dried leaves wow and do you recommend everybody having a chicken coop to grow their own eggs or is this something you need to have a special location for it what are your recommendations on starting a, a chicken um, if your neighborhood welcome with it go with it <laughs> and in Bali um, chicken is people everybody loves chicken so in the night it's a part of the when when we think chicken is a noise we have to think it's a it's a human perspective but if we think it's a we part of the nature and the sound of chicken is part of the nature uh, you can you can compromise with that and your neighbor can compromise with with that because um there's a lot of advantage from composting to to the eggs. Absolutely. This is the hot composting system. So the, the temperature is inside is very hot. You can see the, the smoke in the morning when you put the the light. That's interesting. Hot compost. What is hot compost? How do you make hot compost and what is the benefit hot of hot compost? Actually is, um, when you put uh, waste with with chicken manure in a in a very 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 at least one square meter volume it will be very hot and it's easier to decompose with nice. a lot of bacteria inside it nice yeah amazing i you know i didn't know chickens would give you so many benefits you know they, yeah, they and, do yeah, amazing. And, and chicken it's a lot of things that we throw, like a banana peel, they eat it. They eat a lot of greens. And then they give you entertainment without you having. You don't have to subscribe subscribe any Netflix channel. You have drama in your own garden every day. There's a love conflict, uh, intrigues. <laughs> I bet you some in the audience are like, this guy is crazy, chicken crazy. <laughs> yeah, this is the, the microbe activity in the, in, the, in the ground. So that you can see the temperature is very high and it, it saw the system is working. And yeah, it's only 40 something. And so you can, you can feel it very hot. This is what make, uh, there's no smell at all. And if we see today, there's a lot of, chicken industry with a large chicken coop uh, with inviting a lot of problem like smell actually if we go back to this uh, like a uh, old 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 way of how we keep the, our chicken so it will be no problem at all you just have to be compromised with the yeah a noise it's okay <laughs> wow now i'd like to also discuss about your mindset on what is the value of the land, mm -hmm. right? Because we're talking about rooftop gardening, we're talking about chickens, and there was a mindset that you want all of us to really understand. Yeah. Uh, I know we're talking about chickens, yeah. but I know at uh, at one point we, we talked about this one, the, 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 the function of the house, 
right? Yeah, this is my, my grandfather's house. The function of the house, uh, usually house is, uh, is in South Sumatra. Uh, before it was a panggung house with uh, timber. They have chicken, they have small garden, but they, they can feed their daily needs, but they have a very large, very, very large land. Maybe if you compare to our house in Bali, like a 40 house become one house here in, in South Sumatra. But in the eastern old days. But now, if we only have, this is my house now, 150 square meter land. Can we do that? Can we, can we grow our food? And I've been trying this for maybe the uh, uh, last four years. If we want, we can, we can do it actually. And sometimes people just buy both the property, the land, the house for the sake of investment waiting for the price to, to get up, to, to, to rise up, and then they sell it. But they miss something that we can produce uh, something even without nothing from the help of the rain, sunshine, just make the land fertile so we can take the advantage of it. And it, then, it doesn't have to be long to be your land. You can do it anywhere. You can do it in <laughs> uh, neighbor land. You can plant in the, on the wall. If you don't have any land, you just, if you will, to grow your food and everybody can, can do it. Rihanna, you're such an inspiration. You, you beat the myth that you need a lot of land to grow food. You yourself have proven yourself and you are real, you are human. So if you are in Bali and you have a house and you want to grow something but don't have the confidence, reach out to Priyatna. He is an amazing human being. Priyatna, thank you for sharing your story. Welcome. And, and I'm so, I, have a, I have a question for you in the second part of the webinar. Okay. But thank you for sharing about yourself. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our final and most amazing speaker. She was, yes, she was Miss Indonesia 2017. But not only that, she is here today because she wants to give people a future. Big round of applause to Tia Nilsen, everybody. Hi, Tia. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Krishna, for setting this up. and. Uh, Selamat Hari Raya for anyone Raya. celebrating today. I'm oh. super grateful and honored to be alongside these other great speakers. Um, so a little bit about me. I, um, my name is Achintia Nilsson and I grew up in Bali. My mom is Balinese from Denpasar and my dad is Norwegian. Um, graduated from the Green School in 2017. Uh, right before which I did win Miss Indonesia 2017, which is <laughs> a beauty pageant. Um, so at the end of that year, I competed in Miss World um, and came back with top 10. So <laughs> um, thank you. And um, basically a huge part of why I'm here today is to talk about Give Them a Future, which is a charity that my family and I have been doing since I was quite young. Um, it's to do with helping people living in extreme poverty in villages here in Bali. And we have a three-step model when we go into the villages, which is firstly, what's the short-term plan, um, immediate relief, you know, uh, mostly sambaco and kind of using this opportunity to connect with the villagers, to build a relationship and find out what are their needs, how can we help. And um, the second part is uh, midterm plans, which are usually connected to tools. Most of these villages, we've, we've been working mostly in Kintamani, so most of them are agricultural based. Um, so most of the tools we provide is farming. Um, we've donated a couple water pumps in those areas to give them a source of water um, directly straight to their farms and their homes. And yeah, just to kind of create a sustainable source of income for them so that we can step out because the aim is to kind of let them evolve and grow on their own. And then the third 
part, which is the long-term goals, usually relates to education because then we create a space for the future generations to break out of this poverty cycle. So um, from, from donations we've received in the years that we've, doing this, we've been doing this project, uh, we managed to build one school in the village and yeah, working towards helping other villages and yeah, doing what we can to. So I'm gonna circle that. back about, because it, it's not a small feat. I mean, you're the only person I've met that is uh, <laughs> Miss Indonesia and then, you know, Miss World Top 10. If we can, let's just talk a bit about that, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, on Instagram, uh, you have 89,000 followers, which is not a small amount. You could be doing something else. You could be, you know, doing a modeling career, which you already are, but focusing on that and kind of forgetting about, let's call it the little people, right? The little people, the people who need help. <laughs> so why, why is that? Why are you focusing on, on helping the people who need help? What's, what is motivating you? Um, for me, a huge thing is because when I entered uh, the beauty pageant, it was mostly kind of on a whim and based on like recommendation. And, you know, growing up in Bali as like this kid running around in the rice fields and you, you know what it's like in the island, uh, in the village and everything. And then suddenly entering um, a stage, I, it was completely beyond me to have, to have won that competition. So I truly believed there was some sort of reason or purpose that I've been placed in this position with this platform. And if, if I have been given that space to not be doing anything with it, to not be uh, in service of others would kind of be a waste of, you know, being there. So um, yeah, it was, it was a, a lot different from what I'm used to growing up in this island uh, and a lot of ups and downs. I mean, for the first time speaking in front of large audiences and then um, interviews with news channels and everything, it was very nerve wracking, um, especially at 18, you know, just <laughs> coming out of high school. Um, but also you learn a lot and also kind of a part of Miss World, you have to bring in your own charity project. So I was also able to work with a village um, outside of Jakarta, um, Girijaya village in Sukabumi area uh, that was str um, struggling with undernourishment. So with my kind of green school and plant background, we're kind of educating them saying, hey, you have all this land that uh, was unused and you're growing to make money to make food for yourself so why not use it to grow your own food um, so that kind of also brought a new sense of you know purpose to me in working with people um, who are kind of uh, left behind because there's this you know the, the gap between classes and society is just getting bigger and bigger and I feel like they need to have a voice as well and and what was your experience so we talked about you know the the interviews and everything would it be an experience that you would want to repeat again would it be something that you recommend everybody doing was there you talked about ups and downs yeah we like to share a bit your experience about the ups and downs <laughs> sure um i think there is a common misconception about beauty pageants where uh you know it's just a, a bunch of very beautiful girls walking around in heels on stage but from what I experienced, there's a lot of change that can come about it. You have a huge uh, platform and the way that things are moving, um, most of the winners are people who have the right advocacy, who, who are doing something to change their surrounding environment or inspiring a larger audience um, for change. And I think that's kind of what kept me motivated. Um, the downs obviously is this in super intense schedule, you know, like three to six hours of sleep per night and uh, just going from, you know, a, an interview and then going straight to the charity project or you know, some sort of uh, roadshow with you sponsor. So it's kind of just finding that balance for me was a little difficult in the beginning because I was super into the charity side. Um, and not so much into the beauty side, right. but it was it was a wonderful experience. And then coming into Miss World and seeing all these other beautiful, educated, intelligent women um, 
here to make a change, here to do something about any injustice or environmental injustice was also super, super inspiring. And if, you, if you're asking if I'd recommend it, I think so. I, it, it's, a, <laughs> it's a balance of fun and just like looking at the positive sides of what may seem a little bit uh, not so fun. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's amazing because well, I, I'll never be Miss World for obvious reasons, <laughs> but you know, to to be part of this sudden multinational community that rise to fame directly, I'm sure there's like lots of ups and downs. Like you mentioned, the the pressure, not having a lot of sleep, but on the other hand, you now have this this audience to do to, to speak to right to motivate them now when people talk they'll listen more way more more intently than if you weren't miss indonesia it, it's not fair to say you know every every voice is important but in a world like today you need to either have some kind of tv fame or money or something to be heard right and this is where it's super special because you want this project to be heard, which is give them a future. And so you, you mentioned that it started with your family when you were just seven years old. So you were yeah. quite young, <laughs> but it, you were not, can I say that you were not involved a hundred percent since you were seven years old? So what's the story yeah. there? So uh, it all started with my family and I used to go to Kintamani for barbecues in the weekends and you know, just for some fun. And then, we were having this one, I think we were celebrating my dad's birthday um, just by the lake. And we noticed a couple kids kind of hidden in the forest and we offered them some of uh, our barbecue that we were having. And kind of my dad, my, my dad and my mom were the first people who started this. Um, they noticed that they were hungry and not just, you know, eating because they're enjoying it, but actually trying to eat as much as they could. And so, when I was young, I remember just like going back multiple weekends um, and then like handing out all the these rice packets and some tobacco packets to all these houses that were kind of falling apart. Um, and it was kind of like as a young kid, you didn't you didn't really realize what was happening. But to see all those things, I think kind of instilled some thing in me that came back later on. So when after I mean, we got we got a little bit involved during school as well, just mostly in donations. Um, but like right after Miss Indonesia and then seeing all that and actually doing some sort of change myself, I realized, okay, we need to take this to another level. And my sister and I kind of, um, my dad also wanted to hand it over to us. So we took over and tried to kind of package it as something outside of just a family charity and have, um, have other people have ability to help us and uh, help these people as well because mostly we've been um, relying on donations from Norway and the Norwegian family. So my sister and I uh, created the website and the Instagram and we kind of uh, measured what kind of impact has been going on and we even so like the two villages that we previously worked with was mostly my dad and then me and my sister happened upon another village and that's kind of our own little project now that we're gonna um take to these next few steps that i mentioned earlier. is that the uh, songan village yeah the songan village right yeah well so that started we, because yeah. we were we had a a bunch of old clothes we wanted to donate and went into a random hostel in Kintamani and we're like hey do you know of a village that we could <laughs> donate these clothes to and then saw that you know, it's similar to what uh, Abang and Chunyan village used to be like. And so we're like, do you guys need any help? Wow. So, so you're going village by village, right? And like you said, you know, sometimes the parents start something, but it takes the children to really get it going. When, when you mentioned right now, you know, that, that you were seven years old and you were giving food to kids and they were trying to eat as much as they could. Man, I cried a little when you said that. I was like, is this the Bali that we live in? It feels like we're in a different country. You mentioned that. Yeah. But it it's, is true. Yeah. Right. My God. It's so, it's, it, it has been like growing up and then kind of being aware of those things and realizing there is the part that people are living in. Uh, and there's like this huge 
crowd and then there's another part that is so much less seen and kind of almost hidden yeah wow so what i really really liked about the project that you're doing the benchmark is a three-step model right because you have a lot of charity or donation projects that focus on giving sambaco or immediate aid in food or shelter but there's not a lot of people who are focusing on the short term and the long term right the three-step model is sort of a new thing right we, you're starting to hear it now with, with charity projects not focusing on just giving food immediate food but you're talking about long-term sustainability so that they not only get food to eat in the beginning but then they get the tools to survive so water how to grow their own food and you talk about the final step which is education how where did that concept come from was it something that was inspiring you from something else? Is it something that maybe your father uh, learned? Or how did that happen, the three-step model? That was uh, from from my dad. He's very inspired by the Trihita Karana uh, as well. And so I think the whole thing is that you can't, uh, just, just giving donations doesn't give people incentive to want to uh, work themselves out of poverty. And then they kind of have this dependentness on, on you and, uh, we wanted to make sure that when we're going into some place, you know, we're we're there to actually make sure that they have the ability to do that themselves, because otherwise they will never break out of that poverty cycle, and this whole this whole thing continues. And when you kind of provide those three steps, you know, the the Balinese are already pretty connected to um, God, which is the first part, and the natural environment is when you are um, worried about whether you have food the next meal or not when you're hungry you can't really care much about your environment so that's why we wanted to help with um, poverty as well because with that then you can connect with the environmental side once you're living a more comfortable life and um, yeah in that sense then you'll be connect they're already pretty connected to others and connected to god and we wanted to bring that environmental side as well there's no argument there bounty people are the most religious people you can see prayer yeah. is the most important thing we, we have <laughs> actually too many prayers but that's the different <laughs> argument there now the you're in this webinar because we're here to spread awareness about the give them a future and we I, I'm, we're going to ask you you know what we can do as a community to help give them a future. You talked about sustainable wear project. You know, is that something that we can help with? Tell us more about that. Okay, so uh, mostly we've been um, relying on donations. And uh, right now, on, on my most recent trip to Songan, we did give some bako just because of, a, because of the time we're in right now. It's really difficult for a lot of the people there. Um, and it's very dry, dry land. So that's why we always donate water pumps. And as I went there, um, they were saying, you know, thank you so much for all this food, but we really, really need water. And so that's kind of my, my big project right now is to donate a water pump, which is uh, the amount of pipes that is needed and the pump itself is in the hundred millions. So um, relying on donations, especially at this time is not a sustainable way of going forward, which is, kind of against what I've been saying this whole time, which is why um, I thought, you know, why not use this um, other aspect we have, which is the, the big consumer market, but in a good way where um, uh, it's still kind of um, in, the, in the very beginning of the project, but I wanted to create recycled materials into uh, shirts or uh, at leisure wear or something like that too. Uh, then have the profits go back towards the project and go towards the water pump. So each kind of line would benefit the bigger project of whatever it is that we need at that moment. Well, is and there so like I a, guess yeah, sorry. for help uh, for help from um, people, uh, if you check out our Instagram or Facebook, um, I can direct if if you're willing to donate because our website is still being rebooted right now. Um, otherwise, if anyone here has any, you know, prior knowledge on doing this kind of stuff before or any uh, interest in 
uh, sustainable fashion, sustainable wear, uh, or even if you know you have a business and maybe want to put up a, some sort of donation box, we'd be much much appreciated. Well, I don't know anybody who would say no to have a donation box given by Miss Indonesia. I'm sure <laughs> in the audience, people have a business that they'd be very interested to collaborate. Made Astawai, for example, he has been really successful in getting the community to with their ikat tenun, their handmade weaving. That's something that you guys can can collaborate on, right? And in the audience, I know, you know, I know my family business will be very interested to have a kind of collaboration with we'll Give Them a Future. We'll be happy to have a donation raising. And I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one. You've got amazing people in the audience who will be very, very happy to work with Give Them a Future and our very own Miss Indonesia. Nice. Guys, that is the first part of the webinar. It's been such an amazing introduction of the speakers. Just to give you a recap of what we just went through, we met Made Astawa, who is a, I want to say village leader. You know, he doesn't want to be called village leader. I'm going to call him a village leader. He's a village leader who's been able to get people jobs in his village. He's been interviewed by CNN Indonesia. He's been collaborating with Ibo Koster, the wife of the governor of Bali. Thank you for Made Astawa for what you're doing. Our second speaker is Priyatna, who has been such an amazing inspiration for urban farming. He personally is able to sustain himself for all vegetable and protein needs in his small, I would say small, 150 meter square house. So that's no longer an excuse not to start a farm in your own house. And finally, the beautiful Tia Nielsen, Miss Indonesia 2017, top 10 Miss World, who is focusing on getting people to give them a future. Focusing on areas of poverty and not just short-term help, but a three-step model where they give immediate donations for food, shelter. Second, give them the tools to be able to get water and start a new sustainable life. And finally, the third step, education, to break the cycle of poverty. Thank you for the speakers. And now we are going to the second part of the webinar, which is the open Q&A. Do I have anybody in the audience who would like to ask a question or have a statement that we can discuss further? All right, I will have the first question. Oh, yes, Alicia Sharp, I see you okay. are muted. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, thank you for this today. It was very inspiring. Um, it really, really amazing to hear about all the initiatives that you're all doing. And, you know, I'm in the UK, so you, you don't actually know. <laughs> Because I mean, it's so far away. You don't you don't know until you hear about hear about it through you know the source itself. Um, so I like what you said at the beginning about um, traveling with intention. Um, so I I have a small company uh, in the UK, and um, you know Bali is one of my favorite places. I've been there many times um, when I was living in Asia, and um, I really want to get people to think about you know traveling with intention, traveling better. Um, and I think it's it's wonderful when you hear initiatives like this and it causes people to stop and think about the impact they're having when they visit a place. I mean, you know, you go to Bali sometimes and it's it's packed with tourists, which is great for the economy, but then, you know, what what is it doing to the to the environment and, and how much money is going into the local economy? Um, so part of my um, ethos is getting people to think about that. Um, so it's great to hear what you guys are doing. Yeah. And Alicia, do yes, you, have, you have a question that we can discuss with the audience, or is there a statement that you would like that we focus on? Um, yeah, I just want to um, maybe talk a bit more about uh, what what ideas you think um, would help with that um, sustainable tourism, and what can you know travel agents and tour operators do to promote sustainable travel to Bali. Nice. Okay. So what, what, what can we do to promote sustainable tourism? From the speakers, does anybody want to answer that question? What is your point of view? 
Maybe Made Astawa, since you're also a tour guide. Uh, thank you, Alicia. I think it's from me as a, a tour guide. I think as now some leaders of the Philippines. I think what we 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 want for the future of of the tourism in 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 Bali is more like quality of tourism. Like the maize tourism has been here for like decades, I think. That some 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 people that really appreciate our culture in Bali. Sometimes like Bali is changing, but which is when they come through to feel it like like us we like Indonesia right now, like the President Jokowi have the statement like build the 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 country from the the outside, like membangun um, Indonesia dari pinggiran. That's what the the Indonesia word. The money is direct to the Philippines now. That's the chance for us in the Philippines to build the tourism Philippines, that which is we are Bali, which is the very uh, well known is tourism with base, this culture, and the, the nature. If we compare the nature with out there, like maybe beach and everything, I think we are we are not really number one in in the world. But the culture, I think, is the one that make people come to Bali. To, that, to, that's to, a good point, right? So yeah. t- tell your friends who are visiting Bali, try to go to the villages directly. Don't go to the tourism hotspots. Go out and explore the other parts of Bali, the unwell-known parts. What I about think, from the others? Yes, Mari. I think I think the point is like, if you come to Bali for one week, so is, is Bali is one-stop tourist destination. You can stay in Kuta. This is your one of your experience, Seminyak, whatever, but don't forget, if you really want to see Bali, just go to the Philippines. Ubud themselves is to be seen right now, people say, like, outside of Ubud is more thing you can see. It's Pejeng, for example, Pejeng Kangin is like, I always, when I, when I, I was, like last year, when the tourism still good, I, I have my friend, like, Astawa, why you don't start your tourism village? Oh, I'm waiting of my village get cleaner. Don't wait. That's what they said. So every customer I have, I skip Tagalang. I'm sorry if there's people from Tagalang here. I skip to King. Because I said, I should be see there. Come to my village. You will be only you in the rice field. That's what I say. And then the experience they have is different. They say, like, I've been three times come to Bali. I never seen thing like this. Wow, that's that's a good point, right? Now with technology, don't be afraid to explore other areas. Yes, yeah. Kathy Bradley, you want to add something to that? Um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the collaboration. Um, I was listening to something on CNN International the other day, talking about the COVID crisis, the pandemic in the world, and then people were offering solutions about um, how to get the environment, sustainability environment, economy and culture into some sort of balance so that um, this was a really good time for people to, to take stock of, of all of those things together in, in the recovery. Um, and I was wondering um, to ask um, Priyatnya about like, he's got a wonderful um, sustainable food project there, but how to add things like culture to that, how to add um, that element which will make it meaningful for what the Bali Pledge's aims are for, yeah, and um, how people like myself, um, you know, um, I founded a, um, a, um, uh, an education platform which the parents are very involved. I also noticed how um, um, Miss Indonesia, <laughs> <laughs> how she um she spoke about how the the parents you know her father and mother you know they they initiated that and then the children picked it up and you picked up on that point too that it's really crucial that children pick up from adults so one of the things i've found with our education platform is that we surround our children with entrepreneurial parents and so that the first teachers actually and everything's always got a lot of energy a lot of expertise a lot of innovation it's coming directly to children. So um, I know I'm saying a lot of different things here, but I'm wondering how do we as educators in the future in Bali put these things together so that they have this balance of um, um, uh, sustainability, also working with climate change, um, and also the culture 
I'm particularly passionate about um, preservation of the culture. And I think that is actually the one key for Bali that, that Bali has as an, um, an added bonus over anywhere else in the world for tourism, is that it has this culture which is so unique, so fascinating, so amazing. There's hardly any other countries in the world that have what Bali have in terms of the culture. And how to um, marry all of that together to get a marketable product in the end, um, which is going to attract the right sort of people to Bali to want to enjoy it. So um, I'm that's looking for ways. point of view. That, that, I mean, yeah. the, the, the idea is here, how can we make urban farming also a Balinese culture? Right, you you were asking yeah. Piat now. How yeah. can we just how can we make urban farming more than just growing food, but make it part of what Bali means? Yeah. Brianna, you want to say something about that? Yeah. Or Krishna. This is Krishna. Another Krishna. Um, sorry, just dropping by into the conversation here. <laughs> um. Yeah, that's actually the point it is because uh, it's a really uh, in, uh, very important point into that, uh, what you said there is because we, w food is starting, any culture starts with food. Uh, every, everything starts with growing. Every culture comes from nature. And it's very easy to actually connect those two, uh, those two into dots into going back again to actually to, uh, to be together again. And one of the things that's been done now, and I think a lot of uh, the people here are already doing it with their own sites and with their own uh, villages and stuff, is uh, to actually starting to bring back the actual, uh, just the needs of life, what it is. And it was discussed that it was one of the things, of course, is food. And uh, with urban gardening, like what uh, uh, Payatna is already doing, uh, this is already slowly, uh, one of the places that's already been done is right uh, now is actually in Tegasari, which is Kebun Berdaya, uh, a little community movement that uh, I've been doing with some of my friends there. And that's a whole banjar. That's a thousand to two hundred families starting to garden. Um, and that they're basically already, it's already five months now uh, uh, going and they're already producing a sufficient amount of anything that's actually harvested. They're already going into surplus now we're actually already to the point of like, okay, what else do we do with this? Because we're actually getting too much. Um, but it's something- In only five months. In only five months. Wow. In only five months. Um, so right now it's not all the uh, 1,200. We got at least around 500 uh, households already gardening now uh, with four community gardens already established in the Banjar itself. And it's connected with the Banjar. That's the important one. And that's actually something that I'm surprised because what everybody said, this is actually the first time it's been done, which is a funny thing for me, really, because it's like, what about the Klompok Tani? That's yeah. usually a Banjar thing that's already done. It's like, it, there is the culture. It's like it's nothing new, but it's like it's because it's in the city at the time. Um, then it became something uh, new and exciting, and everybody did it. And um, we're working with the Klian Banjar. We're working with the Kaling. Uh, we got, but the movement was started from the people. There was no, there was we literally was just like, okay, people are gonna need food. There then Pasar is gonna get hit hard. That's already the Kabun Burdaya. I've, I'm a big fan of Kabun Burdaya. It's inspired me to reach out to my Kalyan in Changu. So <laughs> please, in the chat box, put in Kabun Burdaya so the people can already know that there's already a benchmark on how to turn unused land in the village or in the city to make it useful. And this could be like also a collaborative project with Tia Nielsen, Give Them a Future. I'm sure in the villages, you guys have... Uh, pieces of land that are unused, but with collaboration from the community, it can be something to give them food. Uh, in any case, the main thing what I'm uh, saying is basically, right now, there's so many people doing all these things. What we need to do is connect. What we can help each other on these things. I, I can say that Kabun Berdaya, most of those people are now just, they're amazing. The amount of knowledge they just suck in, and I'm pretty sure they can actually go and 
start another garden in another banjar, explain it in a way that uh, more in the Balinese culture that actually in the sick to to another Balinese from another village to another uh, Balinese in one other village, mm -hmm. they can actually connect and to, to keep con connecting. This is uh, something beautiful that the Bali Pledge has done is just trying to connect everyone, but we need, but we really need to start actually move and try to meet and find something that we can support each other in a real movement. Uh, can, because can I'm just I, worried. I, yeah. Yeah. Can, can, can I ask, say, say something? I noticed when um, um, Asawa was speaking that um, he spoke about the Japanese and the translator and the guide and everything. Would it be helpful to have more English um, for uh, people on the island so that um, Bahasa English was able to be used by the Balinese to directly um, feed, uh, to directly link um, the new tourism um, to Ada, you know, like to be able to tell the stories um, and all those sorts of things when people come to visit or um, yeah, I'm just wondering how to be helpful in that way. I mean, that, that's ah, a good yeah. question. I think um, that, that there's a there's a there's always a conflict, right, uh, between. If, if I understand the essence of what Hetty was saying, is that there's the local and the foreign, right? And Mandi Astawa, for example, with the Togetherness Project, it actually started with David Metcalf reaching out to Mandi Astawa. And for Tia Nielsen with the Give Them a Future, it was the Norwegian Balinese family helping helping the locals in a way, right? Uh, does anybody, maybe Madia Stau, do you want to share, or maybe Tia wants to share, how do you feel about that kind of the mindset, oh, it's foreigners helping the locals? Um, I was going to mention this as well before. I think there's sometimes a lot of, like uh, we we come into a space and we make our own perceptions of what we think they want and then follow through with our perceptions of what we think so we need to kind of understand um more on the empathy side of you know being present there understanding what they need asking them what they need and um just on like adding on a youth perspective side i, I know uh, you mentioned being an educator and how to incorporate sustainability um, it's for me, I think it's a lot about action. People are more moved uh, by actions than than words. So, you know, being in a space where you are constantly faced with what sort of, uh, you know, what the injustices or all this kind of horrible stuff that is happening and making people understand like, you know, we're the only ones who can do something about it. Um, so we should do something about it. And, uh, you know, the whole reason as to why I was inspired by my parents is because they didn't just say, hey, we're helping these people. They went they, and showed me what the actions were that they were actually doing, which is what part of this whole webinar as well, right? Trihita Karana in action. So it's about those actions that inspire um, others as well. And I think it's uh, speaking on the whole, like foreign, foreigners helping locals, um, a huge part of what this pause, this COVID have, has given us is time for people to be able to look and see, okay, we can't just exploit this island that we're in. We know we need to be able to work together and bring in that um, culture. And that's that's also like the silver lining that we can take out of this, I think. Nice. Is, and Madea Stawa, there was something that you mentioned uh, about that this, this topic, right? Um, what was it? You mentioned um, ask the locals what they need. Yeah. Exactly. I think um, that's, that's what, what I mentioned to you in the beginning. Like, when you help people, sometimes people see it from outside. Like, oh, they need food. They need things. They suddenly just, just direct to send them a food. But like uh, Cynthia tell, tell us, like, we need to, yes, we, we send them food. And then we learn. And then we, we talk with the local there, what they really need there. So why, what we can help from that. So it's the start to, to help them. Other than they just, just give a food and then the next few days, they need food again, <laughs> right? So if we can give sustainable things to them to, to try to create things. So for the future, we don't need to worry about that again. Mm. Thanks a lot. 
So like we're in this amazing period of time because of COVID, things are changing. A point where before the village elders would not care about the culture or the environment, you see now that they're much more open-minded. Open Burdaya probably only happened because of COVID in a, in a way, right? There's, there's a possibility that because of Gopan Burdaya, it happened because the community, many were unemployed, maybe, maybe many could not find food. And suddenly this solution helped them solve their two biggest problems, which is nothing to do and having no food. So this goes to the bigger picture, right? The beginning of this webinar, we mentioned the Bali patch happened because we need to realize or we need to make sure that when we reopen as a tourism destination, we're not gonna just return back to how it was before, but we can look forward to how it can be. So I'm gonna ask all the three speakers to answer this question. What needs to change in your opinion? And let's have Tia first. What needs to change for Bali in your opinion? Um, I think kind of that whole, you know, moving away from mass tourism, we have this, uh, almost a uh, tendency to abandon culture for, for the sake of, of money. And um, each time something like this hits COVID or whether it was the Agung eruptions or any other previous uh, disaster or anything, it becomes a huge struggle for the whole island because we're so dependent on that tourism. So kind of, I think bringing it back to the, to the locals and uh, bringing in a sense of empowerment, you know, like this is, this is our island and we need to, find another source of kind of maintaining in these difficult times and not just constantly catering to the mass tourism and also just kind of uh, bridging bridging that gap it tends to be a lot of like uh, expat versus locals when there there could be some sort of um, collaboration working together and uh, as uh, Maria Sawa said like understanding you know we're not just giving people because we think that they need it but asking them, what do they actually need? Maybe they don't even want to receive food. Maybe they don't even want our help, but you know, just kind of being there and building these connections and finding out how, how we can work forward, how we can go forward working together instead of kind of a one-sided or two-sided helping each other like that. That's, that's a good point. And I also should, should remove the habit of, of you know, making the whole comparison between foreign and local. It's not about that. It's about we're in Bali, ask the question about how we can help, right? Ask them directly. Madia Astawa, you're next. How, what needs to change for Bali? Uh, actually, we don't need to change anything. Uh, we just need to change the perspective of thinking like tourism is a bonus. Everyone should, 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 should I think, have the mindset of the bonus of what? bonus of the culture that we do the bonus that we do every every day that that's make people's like so interest of what we have in bali so for the future what i i mean like since there's a tourism village desa wisata so the soul of desa wisata is the, the tourism period is a homestay this is what happened in 1930 the king of ubud tried to invite all the artists and stay inside of the palace that's the soul of the tourism in bali not a big hotel, not a five-star hotel. So if we can stop at a five-star hotel in this building, if you guys have a lot of money, try to like, invest of your money and try to contact every single tourism village that happen. So yes. just build a room, a hotel inside of the house. For example, maybe in one of the free, Mr. Bapa Priyatna house, he was having the permaculture in the house. Just prepare one room for a guest. Maybe you want to stay one day in his house and learn about what he's doing there. Hmm. And you can, you can, like my village is what my dream with my village, my Banjar is. I want to make my Banjar become a resort without a build a resort. So we have a 90 house in my Banjar. So if every single house has one room, that means we have 90 room. It's like a, it's a hotel already. We have a, we have a cook in my Banjar. It's working five star hotel. We have a trappist. We have a manager, we have a sales manager. So from the sourcing, we work together to build one, one room in every house. Wow. And then so if we need a cleaner, there's a housekeeping, we can manage one group 
to clean every all of the house. If we need the breakfast, there's a cook in my valley. They can cook for all of this. But still, there is a new, no new building, no new hotel. The rice field will still there. The, then, then every house will get an income. And you uh, ask the investor, they can invest their money to fix one of the room in the house, become a five-star hotel if mm. they want. Or just to be a, a comfortable to stay. That's all. What you need to be stay in the house. If if you come to Bali, if you like to learn about the culture, you stay inside of the house, and then you will see the culture. If you want to stay in five star hotel, there's so many in the world. On the world, right? If you come to Bali, want to see the culture, stay with us. But wow, right so now, making the homestay idea expanded for Bali. That's yeah. amazing. Good job. This 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 this, is, this is, I think is the great idea for the future. And nice. then. People were always talking about like, stop building, stop building. Yes, but the plopper is still there. Yeah. yeah. Why we not deplop the, the tourism pilots? Because right now they need help, they struggle. The tourism pilots need a homestay, but right mm -hmm. now they don't have it. Nice. Why you don't support that? And you still can, can manage by, by you, like, like you have money and then you, you spend one in one house, you build one room. If you come to Bali, you can stay there as well. Yeah, you also stay in a five-star room in a in a homestay. Amazing. Yeah, you can help the the Balinese experience, right? And Priyatna, as an urban farmer, what needs to change for Bali? Yes, I agree with uh, Astawa. Actually, <laughs> Bali doesn't need to change, but we need uh, Bali need to go back to the previous time before. There was no tourism at all, so thinking thinking like uh, thinking like uh, we go back with time travel to, to to the early age, we can easily uh, eat grow anything from just my my house is not a Balinese house with very limited land, but if we see Balinese compound, Please come back to the earth, come back to the locals. The second thing I wanted to talk about was um, I'm involved in a little grassroots project up in a small village in Kangarasam. And uh, we had come into that village and, uh, and we had gone into one of the schools and what they called the library was a big, big mess. And we're like, oh, we want to come in. We want to put these shelves in. We want to do this. We want to do that. And then I spoke with the, the lovely guy, um, uh, Yasser, who we were working with, who's for originally from there. And I said, oh, how about we do this? And he very humbly and very quietly looked at me and says, oh, Pa, mm, can we just get volleyball, net and ball so the kids can play after school because they drink Iraq and get into trouble? I went, oh, okay. And that highlights the beautiful uh, um, you know, comment that Atinta had talked about is around asking really good questions. So I, I don't know how it can be done, but, but asking locals, what do they want? What do you really need help with? What's your priority right now? You know, because as a Westerner, I'm like, oh, I'm all about, you know, how let's get some food, let's have the end of the shelter. And it may be something as simple. Let's want a bit of joy, a bit of fun, just a bit of play. So I love that concept, you know, attend what you talk about. It's just ask really good questions. You're like you're on your way somewhere. Oh, hang on. Do I, do you need some help? Okay. So, so I've starting to learn working with the locals, uh, the importance of asking really good questions. And just the last comment I want to make um, was around the Bali pledge and what Alex had talked about, like uh, the, the, the beautiful, big, hairy, audacious goal would be to make it mandatory that people would sign that. But perhaps there's a way we can make it voluntary initially to, to sign the Bali Pledge through, you know, some sort of affiliation through tourism, tourist operators and hotels of saying, hey, we support this, we would love it and we would welcome you. And I don't know. I mean, you know, obviously you can incentivize that from, from the heart space and the higher vibration and you say, hey, if you you'll commit to that, then we will donate a, a portion of, you know, something towards a, a charity or something that we think. So uh, once again, I just want to thank everyone for their input and their extraordinary insights. It's an honor and a, and, and a, and, and a blessing to be a part of this. That's a good point, right? Before we have to make it compulsory, you can make it a voluntary, a voluntary thing, the pledge. 
Mm. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. And uh, the volleyball story cracked me up for some reason. I just, you know, <laughs> it's uh, funny. Um, we have a question from Sally Lewis. Sally Lewis, would you like to ask the question or would you like me to ask to mention what you said? No, better you ask the question. Yes. Hi, yes. Hi everyone. Um, I just want to echo um, Rob's comments. So inspiring to be here and um, amongst this amazing group. Thank you for putting it together and connecting people and giving this opportunity for, you know, going forward in this extraordinary time that we're in. It's, it's pretty cool. So, you know, hats off to everybody who's behind this and speaking on it. It's very inspiring. Um, I have a quick question um, in regards to how do the Banjars connect with each other? Because there's some amazing work being done across Bali right now in lots and lots of different separate Banjars. And I'm just thinking, is there a way that there is some kind of connection that each Banjar can learn from what the others are doing? You know, it seems like there are some incredible things already being done. We don't need to keep reinventing the wheel. We don't need to keep trying to create new stuff and dig up new energy and new ideas. But let's look at what the existing resources are and some of the amazing success stories that have come out of COVID. And how does that get reproduced through other banjas throughout Bali? Is there some kind of network that happens? Um, I don't know, maybe that's a question for um, Mara Estaba. I'm not really sure who to direct the question to. It's just, I figure, you know, the Balinese may have some kind of network already. I don't know how that gets tapped into or activated, but it would just be cool to use the existing success stories to roll out through our other banjas, potentially. That's a, that's a really good point. So anybody want to answer that question? Because I honestly don't know if, do all the banjars have like their personal WhatsApp group, like Banjar Bali or something? How, how do you, how do the banjars connect? Does anybody know? Does anybody want to answer that question? I think I can say that. I think actually in, in Bali, we, we don't, we don't, we don't have that. But if it's only in one village or one regency, it could have. But what we can, what we can uh, connect this, this idea, for example, the plastic exchange. So like where, where you are right now, just, con just try to contact your, maybe if you stay in the homestay, if you stay in the guest house, or you stay in the hotel in the area, just try to contact with your manager, just like who's the leaders of the banyard of that area and try to connect with the, the plastic exchange, uh, like January Asa or whatever. Or if you want to do like a Cynthia doing, just, just try to connect the, the leaders of the Banjar with, with them. Because right now, right at the moment, the COVID-19, as for me, even I'm the new, new leaders of my Banjar, is, is give us a big lesson, especially for the data. So this moment, the government asking us a correct data, how many people in your banja? How many already, already get help? How many doesn't? What they help? So all the data is really, really valid on the client dinas. So if you like to get uh, like involved with one of the action, like plastic exchange, for example, just connect with your leaders of the banja. Hey, there's an action like this in Ubud. You want to do it here? Try to connect this number. You even can contact my me. So I will, I will very happy to, to assist in any other banja that would like to do the plastic exchange. It's absolutely amazing because the, like I said before, one action can achieve more. Bali clean, people get help and education. Hmm. That is all about. So right now, Hi. yes, yeah. Can I add? Yes, Me? Brianna. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> okay, that's exactly like what pa astawa said what the, the bali pledge is basically the main one of the connections we can do to there's no direct connection in the banjo right now but anybody who just feels like there's the uh, plastic exchange in pa astawas connect that to uh, uh if you if you want to have that in your banjo if you want to know how to garden go to gurbun berdaya if you want to know how to dance and doing garden there's 200 kids i'm teaching that's dancers in Borneo right now, and they're gardening while singing Tetembangan Bali, which is an old Balinese song, which you do it while farming. If you want like that, just connect everyone. So this is already really cool. So if anybody needs help or want to collaborate with all of us, just connect. Bali Pledge! <laughs> and and uh, Krishna, share your, share your number or something that people can reach out to you because 
you are a very good connection to have, especially in Bali. <laughs> so I know, I know it's going to annoy you because you can have a lot of chats and WhatsApps, but, or share a number that we can contact you or that the audience can contact you with for local connection. Yes, Hattie, you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that last uh, rainy season, when we had all the um, the pollution come down the rivers and we got the blame all over the world for polluted oceans and everything, and we we went into we swung into the mode of cleaning up the rivers, and I saw a lot of um, it wasn't quite competitive, <laughs> so, but it was almost competitive. One bunch, uh, one one region would do it, and then the next region would then not be want to be outdone by cleaning their rivers and then it caught on all through Bali and, and everybody was climbing down into the into the rivers and fishing out stuff and it was all over social media. And so I think social media is a really good um a good thing um for Bali in this way. And uh, Sally you know each of uh, Bali is divided into seven regencies and those are very historic, very, very historic and very religious as well. So the Banja systems are inside there. And I think that uh, the village heads are a lot more aware of what's going on now. But um, yeah, it's just about getting in there and spreading the word and uh, getting it out there. And, and I'm yeah. just loving what I'm hearing. Yeah. But yeah. To actually to answer Sally's original question, yeah, is there is there a network to connect all the Banjars? No, there is not. Right. Every Banjar is kind of like its own country. But do do start from they call it the grassroots from your own, your own village, where you're staying quite often. I mean, I do the same thing in Balinese to talk to the Kalyan Banjar. I don't, I don't go myself because it's, it, they're very, it's very slow and everything. I send my manager or my gardener to, to, to meet the person. And only recently, if I can be honest, since COVID that I've been connecting with the village elders and, and the village chiefs. And it's not easy because there's a different mindset there, you know, I'm trying to compost, they call composting rubbish. Why do you want to take care of rubbish? But that's, that's the way to go. So as Madi Astawa says, go directly to your Kalian, you know, bring a translator if you can't speak Bahasa, but that would be the first step that you can do. Uh, I'd like to, uh, there was a chat by Gil Petersol. If you don't know, he is the Tony Robbins representative for Russia. If, if I'm, please correct me if I'm wrong, Gil. But he mentioned that, is there a knowledge sharing platform? And you know, the answer is no, not yet. And that could be something that be that could be working on. I, there's, there is a called the Bali NGO and Associates. But I, for some reason, I think they're not fully active right now. Can anybody clarify on that? I think it's still in the works of creating that sort of uh, knowledge source um, because there is quite a few NGOs involved in there and they have a lot of data with villages and people in need um, and it's about kind of putting that together and then coming out. Right. With, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to just very, very briefly share. Hi, everyone. Uh, super inspiring day, by the way. A random kind of pop in. I didn't even know this was happening. I just had a baby a few days ago, so this was randomly shared with me. So thank you for all of you that are sharing. Um, we, we've just started working on a, on a really cool project, nonprofit project called the Atlas Tree Network. Uh, it's all inspired by Bali and it's basically starting knowledge sharing in Bali. Uh, and the aim is to get to 100 villages before the end of the year, to at least get 100 villages to be a part of a program that's supporting them with educational, economical, permacultural, health, cooking, a lot of really, really simple kind of uh, guidelines and knowledge sharing between them and some that we've learned from the Western world, you know, so some really amazing agriculture and permaculture um, life hacks and speakers that we've learned from England and not from England, from Holland and from Israel. Uh, there's some amazing uh, composting solutions that we've learned from a few other countries. But today what I heard was completely blew my mind. Uh, I'd just be happy to really support and share. And we're doing this as as giving back to Bali. Mother Bali has given us all quite a bit and we're all very happy with our businesses, but this is a way for us to, to give back and serve. So if I can help in any way, I'm, I'm, I'm here. And what I do with Tony Robbins is this much. I do a few other things in my life, but Tony has been a big inspiration in my life. But thank you, Krishna, for what you're doing. That's thank amazing. you, all of you. If you have some kind of link or something that to connect about the Atlas Tree Network so people can 
either subscribe. At, at this stage, not because I still don't have my kitas. I'm waiting. In November, I'll have my kitas. So there is no link. It's all in-face discussions. We meet a lot in Abud. Uh, it's, it's already been going on for a while. It's connected to a number of other projects. Uh, we already have many, many partners. We have four different kings that are supporting this from four different regions. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to anyone about it. At the very least, share your LinkedIn profile. So we, we're not on the wrong Gil Petersel. <laughs> yeah, and no, that I'm, way... I'm, the only, I'm the only Gil Petersel on Google in the world. So very easy to find me on Instagram, on, on LinkedIn. There's only one. You're lucky. My name is Krishna. There's already two Krishnas in this webinar. So don't, don't, don't take Krishna as a name for a son. <laughs> Thank so, you again for what you're doing, everyone. Really inspiring. Yeah. I appreciate you very much. There was a question in the chat from Priscilla Guedes. Would you like to ask the question yourself to the group? Yes. Hi. Hi there. Um, I have a question for us, Cynthia. And the question is, if you can share a little bit about your experience in the Green School and how the educational system is in Bali. Like, do you see it's possible to integrate these projects in schools? Well, in general, not. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I see in the chat currently schools are closed here, but um, uh, as for the projects, we do have kind of, I, I think uh, my old teacher and head of high school is here actually from Green School. Um, so basically we have this uh, pro a program called like Jalan Jalan on Wednesdays where it is about these projects that students are interested or passionate in they can be involved in. And um, I think it's about kind of just having those projects available and uh, working it into the curriculum, which is a lot of what Green School was, I believe, um, just having these uh, projects available as part of uh, something we could include in our curriculum and everyday you know, work uh, before we graduate and then potentially continue after graduating as well. And I know from what I've heard um, with a few other students that's becoming sort of a commonplace thing in other international schools here in Bali as well, um, community service projects and other sort of projects that uh, are almost mandatory as part of the school and then it, it becomes a, something that they love to get involved in anyway, so. And that would be amazing if we could integrate the teaching of Green School in the local education system, that would be mind blowing. I, as if anybody would have any ideas on where we could start, um, that, that's been a challenge, I think, for most people, especially the local education system is very different to the international education system and even less to the green school system because that's a very, very specific school. So it's almost nearing the end of the webinar. I'd like to hand it over to Alex from the Bali Pledge to close the webinar and also he to whatever he wants to mention that's important. Thank you so much, uh, Krishna and everyone. I'm blown away every time. I mean, what a better way to spend Kuningan than with all of you, you know, as we are sending the spirits back home to uh, just reflect and connect and inspire each other. I'd like to leave you with some inspiration of what's, what's next and how to move forward. And I'm really inspired by all of you. So just about me in two seconds, I'm the founder of uh, Be Greener, which is a community of mindful change makers all over Indonesia. I started Refill My Bottle, which is an app showing you where you can refill your water bottle. Did a lot during the eruption of Agung um, and started the, the Bali Pledge. I would like to uh, end before I speak with a little, stay with us, I'd like to share with you uh, my screen and show you a little, a little video. It's not too long and you will be happy if you stay. For those who don't know, those are starlings, endangered species of body. They are famous for doing what is called a murmuration. It's a mystery how they communicate with each other, but you can have thousands, hundreds of thousands of birds moving in unity. And actually they were studied. They were deeply studied to understand how 
do murmuration work? How can these thousands of birds move at the same time in the same direction? And here is the answer. They don't. Each bird is communicating with five or six birds. That's all they are doing. And by repercussion, this is impacting the whole movement. We're constantly trying to build great movements who have big impact. I think we should focus on impacting people that are around us. Just think of five, six people around you that you could impact. Whatever you learned today, whatever you got inspired with, just share that. Don't try to make it an international project. Just share it with five, six people around you. Be the change. Impact people around you. We can be the murmuration of Bali. Let's bring back the starlings. Wow. Thank you so much for uh, your facilitation, Krishna. You're doing uh, amazing work. I'm very honored to have you and everyone else join. We will do that every month. Um, share the pledge, share it on social media, sign it. Let's get it to the governor so we can uh, get that impact. But at the same time, let's focus on, focus on the change that you are making for yourself, not for everyone else. Don't try to tell people what they need to do. No one wants to hear that. Just be the change for yourself. I love that analogy. Just grow your food. Just take care of yourself. Let everyone take care of themselves. That's how we can do it. I don't help others because I care. I help others because I feel good. I do it because that's how it helps me and bring it back to, to you. And if you do that and you live in integrity, everyone else will take care of themselves. And together, that's how I believe we can uh, make a beautiful impact in the world. We are the ones we've been waiting for, but you are the one you've been waiting for first and foremost. Wow. Now I let you end. Amazing, Alex. That was an amazing video and your narration while the birds were flying about. Nothing could be simpler said than share it with five to six people start with a local local solution then with integrity it will grow the movement will grow the bali pledge is no longer a small movement it's now a very real thing it's a connector of people it's a connector of movements start small but start now i'd like to say a big big thank you to the three amazing speakers for the time energy and for what they're doing Made Astawa, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you very much, Tia Nilsson and Priyatna. Thank you very much. You guys have been amazing. For the audience today, you heard what Alex said. This is a monthly webinar. Be part of the change. Be part of the community. Bali loves you. Au revoir. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Thank you, everyone. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you.